Okay, great. I see people are still uh, arriving in there. So um, I think we'll get started. Um, my name is Maria Keeney, as, as many of you know, and um, on behalf of Smurfit Executive Development, I'd like to warmly welcome you here this morning. I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, Stephen Boyle, who's going to discuss purpose and executive presence with us here this morning. Um, Stephen Boyle is um, Programme Director of our Diploma in Advanced Management Performance, which I'm going to tell you a little more about at the end of the webinar. But he also teaches um, winning negotiation strategies and on many of our customised programmes. I'm going to be back at the end, as I said, just to discuss the uh, programme in more detail for those of you who are interested. But also I'm going to be putting your questions to Stephen throughout the webinar, so do please include them in the chat because we want to keep it as interactive as possible. Um, so as I say, I'll see you at the end, and uh, for the moment, I'll hand you over to Stephen. Thanks so much, Stephen. Thanks, Maria, and a warm good morning to everybody. I'm really glad you've come here because this is a topic that I've become very passionate about. I've been teaching and training people in areas like negotiation, decision-making, change, and transformation for a little over 20 years now. Um, but... I started to become, after many years of doing that, I started to become very interested in trying to go a little bit deeper in a question that was always being asked me in one shape or other. How can I generally improve my impact? How can I generally improve my performance? And as program director of the Diploma in Advanced Management Performance, I decided we needed to have a module that is focused on that, is focused on the individual and their performance. And that's what I want to talk to you about a little bit this morning. Now, very often when people think about self-improvement, uh, they might think about something like setting New Year's resolutions. Um, you may already be aware, be aware that this can be a little bit of a minefield. Research conducted by the fitness tracking app Strava three years ago showed that a majority of people failed their New Year's resolution by the Friday of the second week of January. That was last Friday. They call it Quitter's Day. That's a depressing thought. Now, we know that that applies specifically to exercise goals, and maybe it's a difficult time of year for people to start doing that if the weather's cold or wet or windy. But we're actually not doing much better in other areas either. Research at the University of Scranton uh, in Pennsylvania showed that 80% of people drop their New Year's resolutions in across all areas by February, and only 8% ended up achieving their goals. Now, there are plenty of actually well-established goal setting and motivation theories that can offer us lots of useful pointers and boost our chances of achieving our goals. Like for example, setting realistic and concrete goals, starting with small, quick wins linking new behaviors into existing habits so that they're easy to pick up and they become habits in themselves and so on. And typically people's New Year's resolutions are focused on personal activities and behaviors. You may think that your business plans or even your career goals couldn't suffer the same fate as our New Year's resolutions to become better versions of our personal selves. But you're probably wrong if you think that. An MIT Sloan Management article by uh, Grenny, Maxfield, and Schimberg studied executives who were encountering difficulty in heading change initiatives or dealing with organization problems like silo thinking or accountability. And it showed that those executives had just the same challenges in succeeding in those initiatives as they did in their attempts to change their own personal unhealthy or lifestyle habits that they wanted to change. So if you've already set yourself goals for 2022, whether they're business or personal, I want you to put them on hold. I would suggest that you don't start this year by planning what you want to achieve, what you want to stop doing, what you want to start doing. A much better starting point is to figure out why. After all, we know that successful companies establish a mission statement to guide everything that they do, and we should be doing something similar. What I propose is that you establish your purpose rather than your mission. So put the goals on hold and think about your purpose. 
having a purpose will not only lead to a greater chance of the achievement of goals and exceptional performance, it also provides a measurable boost in well-being. And I'm not talking here about wellness, that rather vague catch-all phrase that's increasingly trotted out and is becoming a rather large industry. There's actually solid medical evidence for the claim that purpose is a pathway to greater well-being. Here's what a doctor says about the benefit of purpose. This is based in solid research. Research by a US Canadian team conducted over a 14 year period found that people who lived their lives with a strong sense of purpose lived longer and healthier lives than those who did not. Specifically, those who set large goals that directed their day-to-day their day -day activities were the healthiest. Another study at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine found that our search for meaning follows a U-shaped curve in our lives. So that in young adulthood, people's decisions about their career, their education, their family are tremendously important to them. And they dominate a period of anxiety when people are really searching hard to find meaningful ways to live their lives. Now, some people are lucky enough to discover the answers to those things as they approach or even before they reach middle age. But then again, it's not an, on, on, at all unusual. I meet plenty of people who are in and maybe even beyond middle age who say, I still don't know what I want to do or what I want to be when I grow up. So many, if they don't find that, they just go with the flow of whatever direction their decisions or more often the decisions of others have taken them. Um, I remember having done quite a lot of work with large groups of junior doctors, pre-consultant level hospital doctors. And a frequent comment I get from them when I ask them, why did they become doctors? When they report the stresses they go through, the many aspects of the job they dislike, is they say, well, because I got high points in the leaving cert. They weren't driven by a sense of purpose. Already at that young age, it was because they got the high points or that became subsumed as their sense of purpose. Um, now, as people start to get settled in their lives, in their 30s, their 40s, and so on, um, we don't seem to feel such a need for purpose. The study, the U-shaped curve study, shows that, that the bottom of that U hits around that kind of approach to middle age and middle age, because I guess we're occupied with other things. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we've found our true purpose or that the importance of it has receded for good. We're more likely burying that big question. Um, it re-emerges and the U-curve starts to go back up as people start to approach retirement uh, or as the kids leave home. And the search for purpose gets stronger as people start to enter that phase of their lives. Um, the study also shows that at all stages of life, where people continue to struggle to find meaning, this is associated with poor health and even less effective brain function. Whereas a, self, a greater sense of purpose aligned in the studies with greater contentment in life and better physical and mental health. This is echoed in other studies as well. Dr. Philip Muskin, a professor of psychiatry with the University at the Columbia University Medical Center in New York, says that if people can't find meaning in their job, which is one I wanted to come to, this is likely to make them unhappy, not necessarily depressed, but uncomfortable in life. That may not seem surprising. They will effectively go to their graves with their music still inside them unplayed. So a question we all need to ask ourselves is, is our life driven by purpose or is it drifting without it? Are we setting kind of random goals about like, that seems fun, or I should try stand up paddling, or maybe I need to do more of this or less of that, or we need to increase this by 10% and reduce that by 15% this year. Um, if we feel that we've drifted from our purpose, we can benefit from having a stronger sense of purpose, then all of this is a sobering thought, but none of this research has to be depressing. In fact, Anyone can take practical steps to find their sense of purpose and to imbue what they do with meaning.
you could find a sense of purpose around the corner or even right where you're standing. In the final module of the, dipl the Diploma for Advanced Management Performance, I work with participants to help them increase the impact that they have in their chosen fields. And to maximize that impact, we need to clarify our sense of purpose and strengthen our presence, which I'll come to a little bit later. And I want to give you a little bit of a taste of what executives can do to build on these areas. Now, you might feel that you have a sense of purpose, but the best way to strengthen and harness that purpose to enhance your impact is to go a bit further than having a sense and to articulate it clearly. And the way I encourage people to articulate their purpose is into a written statement of purpose that will act as a touchstone. There's numerous benefits to going beyond simply having a sense of purpose that you can't put your finger on and crafting a personal statement of purpose. The best way to clarify and strengthen your purpose is to articulate it. This in turn drives better goal setting and achievement, enhances your executive presence, a little later I'll explain how, and guides you when you face important business and personal decisions in life. And of course, the clearer your purpose is, the more you are likely to reap those well-researched health benefits that I referred to earlier. Um, by the way, before I go on and say a little bit more about how you can get to that sense of purpose, um, please note that Maria said, you're very welcome to ask questions as we go, and I'll pause here and there if there are questions to take, your, to take those questions and, and uh, comments. Okay, so what is a statement of purpose? For starters, it should be personal to you. It should really reflect who you are, your passions or strengths, your way of tackling opportunities or grappling with life's challenges or workplace challenges. Now, this doesn't mean that the statement you come with is you come up with is going to be mind-blowing to anyone else but you. In fact, to others, it might seem cliched or trite. And someone else might actually come up with the same statement. But the important thing is that it has a unique and deep meaning to you. It really speaks to who you are. Another characteristic of a really strong statement of purpose is that it applies to the way you work as well as to the way you live the rest of your life. Work isn't separate to life. It's, it's a part of it. It's a big part of it. Those people who are driven by purpose bring that to their work and to the rest of their lives as well. If our purpose is solely directed at how we work in particular, then technically speaking, we could say we're purposeless and drifting in the rest of our lives or vice versa. So the statement of purpose should be holistic. It should encompass work and other aspects of life. And this in turn means that a well-considered purpose statement should be more than just a statement of a single aspect of life that's important to you, such as your job or your family. Like my purpose is to be the best of this particular type of thing. Like my purpose is to be the best lecturer or the best trainer or whatever the case may be, or my purpose is to be the best dad in the world or something like that, if, if that's how you're feeling about it. Um, you're not your job. You're not even your family. You could lose your job. Someday you'll have to retire. If you have kids, they'll grow up. They could move to the other side of the world. Um, long before you had this job or this family, you were and you still are an individual in your own right. And if you anchor your purpose strictly to something that's outside you, like your job or your career path or your husband, then it's not really your purpose at all. It's someone else's. Okay. So. Um, how can you get there? How can you get to the, the statement of purpose? And I see that in the chat, there's a question from Michelle looking for tips on aligning your personal and professional statement of purpose so that it becomes more authentic. Well, I see them as not being separate. I see the statement of purpose as something that would encapsulate how you are inside and outside the workplace. 
So now let me give you some practical tips on how you can develop your statement of purpose. Articulating a statement of purpose doesn't have to mean attempting to answer what is surely one of the biggest questions in life for humanity, which is, why are we here? Why am I here? Instead of starting to ask, why are you here? There are lots of easier questions that we can ask ourselves to get closer to identifying our purpose and writing it down. And I really mean that we should reflect. If you want to do this well, you need to make time and space for reflection to be on your own with pen and paper. I would actually discourage you from using a device because devices mean distraction. And you sit down, lock yourself in a room or go to a quiet private place and ask yourself questions like, um, when do you feel your strongest sense of purpose? When have you felt really imbued with purpose? Really like what you're doing, what you're involved in is really truly the essence of you. And when you start to identify those things, ask yourself, why is that? Go as deep as you can. Um, so for example, you might say, uh, well, I have a great sense of purpose when I'm organizing uh, meetings of minds, whether they're like people getting together at work or friends and family, or perhaps friends who don't know each other. And then ask yourself why again? Well, why does that give you a sense of purpose? And you might say, well, because at those times, I really enjoy bringing people together and I starting new connections or, or and conversations or reconnecting old conversations and ask, well, why is that? And you might say, well, because I've always been the most dependable connection in any group I've been involved in, whether it's work or social. And you ask, why is that? And you might say, well, my real skill and joy, I suppose, is in involving everyone and creating a community of belonging. And now you start to say, wait, now that feels really true to me, that now I feel closer to a statement of purpose. So we have to reflect quite deeply. You might start with a question like this, what makes you sing your song? Um, or choose something else that seems almost themed to a hobby that you enjoy. That's one perhaps if you enjoy music. Or you might take it from another angle. Ask yourself, how have challenging life experiences shaped you? Um, in a recent delivery of this program, the, the Diploma for Advanced Management Performance in this module, one of the participants had gone through incredibly challenging life experiences and yet was drifting in his career and in his family life and identified that and spoke very poignantly in the class about how when he started to work on his sense of purpose, he used this question to mine a deeper sense of where he needed to get to. Or you might look at your career as a starting point and ask yourself, why did you make the choices that have led you to this point? Um, in another class I taught, one of the participants said, as many people do when I start to ask them to work on their statement of purpose, said, I'm really struggling with this. It seems so abstract and soft and wishy-washy. This isn't for me. I'm an engineer. I'm a very practical person. I build things. I said, okay, so maybe this evening, Go home and think about that. Think about why did you make the choice to become an engineer if it was your choice? What led you down the path? What is it you've loved about that in the past? And the next day he came in and he said it was a light bulb moment when he started to reflect on that because he started to think how that connects much more deeply to who he is. And this is not an easy process. Um, getting to your, your statement of purpose is something that it does take reflection, it does take time, um, but it's worthwhile. There are benefits for this. Um, there's a question in there from, uh, from Malvika, which is, could I clarify the difference between goals and purpose? So purpose is going to be a longer lasting thing. So an organization may have a mission and an individual may have a statement of purpose. The statement of purpose is really about how do you like to go about things? What, what, it, what spells out your approach? Um, mine is there is always another PB to aim for, okay? Now, why is that my statement of purpose? Well, one of my passions in life is running. I love running. I'm not a super talented runner, but I love doing it. I love getting out there, going for a run. 
And um, runners often talk about their PB, their personal best. Uh, I may not be that close to reaching my personal best of the past, but I might hit a personal best for my age group. Um, but I came up with that because as I started to reflect on my sense of purpose, I realized that that's a philosophy, a mentality that I take into what else I do, into the teaching, the training I deliver, into the classroom, and, to in, and into other hobbies and activities. It may, as I said, seem trite or cliched to other people. I don't encourage people to say, okay, well, I'll take that as my personal statement too. That would suit me fine. Um, you've got to find your own that speaks to you. And that's one that speaks to me. It's not a goal. It's about how I do things and why. Okay, so that's a little bit about purpose, but I've referred also to the role that presence plays in making an impact. So I want to spend a bit of time now with you exploring, well, first of all, what is presence? And then uh, getting a little bit deeper into how we can enhance our presence. Um, so this definition that we have here indicates that presence is, it's something closely related to purpose. It's where your purpose is aligned to you and you're really in the moment. So you feel purposeful when you're present. Having a greater strength of purpose will help you to pursue an aim of strengthening your presence. Now, um, a common phrase uh, that we hear, and one indeed that we chose uh, for the title of this webinar, because it's so widely applied and it's popular, is executive presence. Now, here's a definition of executive presence. And while there's nothing wrong with this definition, I'm very cautious about it because I believe that many people can misinterpret or even misapply the concept of executive presence. I think that this phrase that we see on the screen here, this definition that we see on the screen here could be misinterpreted to mean that executives only need to be outwardly convincing and charismatic regardless of whether there's any real substance underneath. Now for starters, this is why I see the need to link purpose with presence in your drive to have a deeper impact. Um, that question that we had earlier from Michelle asked, how can we align personal and professional statements of purpose so that we're more authentic? So authenticity is something to strive for. Um, the superficial reading of a definition of presence, I believe is quite dangerous. Um, a, a case in point, a very fresh case in point, is the recently convicted criminal fraudster, Elizabeth Holmes of Theranos. Ahead of the recent trial outcome of her conviction, an article in one of the last month's Economist editions pointed out that although charisma might be a perfectly reasonable trait for investors to want to see in a startup founder, it shouldn't be equated with competence, or indeed, I might add, with integrity. And unfortunately, for the hoodwinked investors who were conned into investing, putting their money into Theranos, charisma was a trait that Holmes had actually deliberately sought to develop and polish. Um, studies a few years ago done, uh, research done a few years ago at the University of Lausanne showed that executives who were taught and trained in three or four techniques for enhancing their outward charisma could appear to be more, um, to inspire more confidence in those who observed them. Now, I don't agree with that approach of just polishing up someone's outward charisma, their outward executive presence. So in this diploma, we seek to go deeper than outward charisma in helping participants to strengthen their inner executive presence as well as the outward. Okay, so let me say a little bit more about what presence is then truly. Um, I would associate these kind of ideas with presence. Um, it's about, for example, being present. Presence means therefore you're able to concentrate. You're very focused on what's going around you and you're accurately aware of what's going around you. That's often linked to the concept of mindfulness, something that also I think gets a bit misinterpreted or a bit of a knocking, but I'll come back to that. 
it's linked to being authentic, to being yourself, and to being emotionally intelligent to others around you as well. It's not a solely selfish thing. It's not just about you. It's not about purely about being um, in your own moment. Uh, people who are really focused and aware are actually more acutely aware of the needs of others and accurate in appraising what's going on around them. Um, okay, so uh, if that's the case, um, here's maybe a clearer definition of presence that also brings into light a bit of a problem because it's great to talk about this idea of presence, but it's not this thing of, let's say, becoming transcendent, of, let's say, meditating for years and years and years until you're some kind of enlightened being. Our presence comes and goes. Even while I'm concentrating on giving a webinar like this, my presence is occasionally maybe fractionally drifting. And your presence, as you're trying to attend to something that's important to you, is drifting. In fact, even when people are engaged in something that's really important to them, like delivering a key presentation or pitch, or spending time with some loved ones who they haven't seen for a while, their presence can actually drift quite a lot. So presence is really not a pervasive thing. And some people suffer from this an awful lot. Increasingly, many people are multitasking. They're trying to do many things at the same time. For example, you might be sitting on the sofa trying to watch a movie or a series, but you've got your laptop there, you've got your, your iPad there, and you're trying to tap away at a work email either, or you're cutting back and forth between those things very, very quickly, so you are effectively multitasking. Or you're picking up your kids, and at the same time, you're trying to make a voice call in the car, or uh, think of what groceries you need, and so on. Um, and in those moments, you're really not present in any of the things that you're doing. In fact, studies of what goes on in the brain shows that when we think we're multitasking, we're not really performing multiple tasks at the same time at all. Our brain is actually struggling to try and chop and change and time slice between tasks. And we actually do all of those tasks worse and at a lower level of IQ, also at a rate that more rapidly exhausts our brain and therefore reduces our cognitive capacity. Now, the good news is that our presence can be strengthened. Before I explain how we can strengthen our presence, let me explain some of the good reasons why. Um, presence increases our performance because we're aware of and we pay attention to priorities. Those who, instead of multitasking, are able to focus very clearly and intensely on both their priorities and on attending to those things, get them done at a higher level of IQ and quicker. In leadership, and I've made this connection, in leadership, but also in personal relationships, the, the more distracted we are, the less we're capable of really connecting to people around, we, around us. For example, you know, kids complain if their parents are not fully paying attention to them. It's, look at me, look at me, you're not paying attention to me, right? And you know what? They're right if you're multitasking. You're not paying attention. Um, but it's the same with adults. It's the same in leadership. People know if you're drifting, if you're not focused, if you don't really care. And then um, there are well-being uh, benefits. So I've already emphasized the IQ effects, the negative IQ effects of multitasking. It also has a negative effect on, effect on learning. And being present, being focused, escalates learning, escalates our accumulation of understanding and of knowledge, and it reduces stress. Okay, so how can we get there? Well, some of the things that we can do to enhance our presence are relatively quick. We can have some quick wins but most require effort and perseverance, unfortunately. And I mentioned earlier mindfulness. And actually in a recent uh, room of participants, um, somebody asked me the question, it wasn't actually in this module, it was in another module, and I directed him to consider this program, Diploma in Advanced Management Performance. Um, he was going through a tough time at work. He was talking about a really challenging set of negotiations that the company's involved in. And he said, can you give me any suggestions at all uh, as to how 
I can stop waking up at five o'clock in the morning consumed with thoughts about this thing. Or at least if I do wake up at, my five, at five o'clock in the morning, I'm able to control those thoughts and every waking moment isn't filled with the stress of this situation. And before I could say anything, he said, and don't say mindfulness. Well, mindfulness actually means being aware, being able to control your mind. Mindfulness practices are, whether you like it or not, something that I would highly recommend for people who feel that they're, they're pushed around by the stresses of life, that um, when adverse events happen, they really knock us, send us reeling. Mindfulness helps us to be aware of priorities, helps us to absorb stresses, helps us to absorb adversity and to get back on our feet. It's about being attentive and in the moment. Um, one of the most powerful practices towards being more present that we can engage in is to meditate, but many people have a negative perception or even negative experiences of meditation. I think often because of the way it's pitched, I don't particularly like this kind of transcendent yogic kind of image that meditation has, because what the practice of meditation is really about is about learning to pay attention. You pick a focus point, let's say you're breathing, and you learn to pay attention for that, and you fail. We all fail when we try to do that because our thoughts drift. And that's one of the things that people find frustrating. And yet that's part of the practice. This is one of the benefits. It's that you start to notice when your thoughts drift and you start to develop the firm habit of redirecting your thoughts. Then if you're waking up at five or four or 3 a.m., you're able to direct your thoughts more powerfully, more purposefully, where you want them to go and away from the direction that they're going in. So meditation is, I think it gets a knocking, I think it's misunderstood. Um, another practice that I might say, this is potentially a quick win, but for many people, it's not easy at all. It's something I've mentioned already, it's devices. It's notifications, it's emails, it's messaging, it's being always on, being constantly distracted, okay? Um, when we're distracted like that, all of our presence is sapped away and it's sapped away long after those distractions happen. So we need to take control increasingly as devices come into our lives. Yeah, sure. Some of the, uh, the, the tools that we're, we're provided with can be incredibly powerful, but increasingly they're sapping away our ability to be present. And some of the manufacturers seem to be aware of this to a certain degree, like they're even in, I see in new versions of, of iOS for Apple, they, they have a, a function called focus where you can focus on different types of level of concentration or activity. Um, but the point is, you know, all of these tech companies are throwing more and more temptations for distraction our way. So we need to get to grips with that. Um, one possibility for real quick wins is actually breaks including really, really short breaks, acknowledging that we can't be present and focused in the moment all the time. So that instead of trying to be, we take a break. But then there's another challenge for presence, that when we're taking a break, we need to be taking a break. And yet when many people take a break, what's the first thing they do? They whip out the phone and they're looking up notifications on the phone and they're not really being present in the moment of taking a break. I did say, however, that you know some of the work towards presence is requires more effort, effort and persistence. We can boost our ability to focus, to concentrate, to be mindful, to be aware by having healthy exercise plans, healthy eating plans. And when I say diet, I mean nutrition. I don't mean going on a diet. And one that I think is increasingly neglected, getting good quality of sleep. Good quality of sleep um, it means you're getting seven to eight hours of sleep. And you're getting the vast majority of the sleep, that sleep well before starting well, well before midnight. In fact, starting as early as 11, 10, 30 or 11 p.m. OK, something that might seem unachievable to people. But in turn, for these practices, there are many easy ways to start changing your habits and improving those habits. I said earlier that purpose can enhance presence. And I've referred to this a few times. I want to come back to it. And that's because if you have a strong sense of purpose and you're driven, 
you're more likely to persist with some of those, let's say, more difficult, more challenging routes towards being more present. Then if you're armed with a clear purpose and stronger presence, you're ready to set those goals and have a bigger impact. And this is the final area that we look in, in the Diploma for Advanced Management Performance in the final module. And we have a very structured approach to setting purposeful goals. And we help participants to develop personal action plans that are really built in their own, founded in their own sense of purpose. The action plans look at three areas, the goals, but also the actions to be taken for those goals and the underlying support that's needed. And all of this is wrapped up in ensuring that they're aligned with your purpose. And because your purpose is holistic, your goals aren't just going to be workplace goals. They're going to focus in other areas as well, family or money, leisure or health, and there are lots of others that you might fill in. So a good starting point is your purpose and then asking what areas you want to address in your plan. Okay, so um, thanks for your attention. I'm going to take some questions, comments uh, now. Um, I see some nice uh, reflections there in the, in the chat. Um, I like that, uh, that comment there from Therese. Don't just do something, sit there. I like that. Um, and to be in hell is to drift, to be in heaven is to steer. I absolutely agree with that. But then Glenn comments, that it's been there for months, but he's only seen it now. So uh, sometimes it's right in front of us, as I said, and we're not necessarily present. Uh, you know, the, I, I, I've um, heard you speak on this a few times and it's always very inspiring, but also very practical. Um, as you know, I, I did the Diploma of Management Performance myself and this was my favourite module. But like you said earlier, I really struggled at the start of the module in terms of, of writing down my purpose. And as far as I remember, we did a little bit of work before the module on our purpose. And then you do the module and, and you and you re-examine re your purpose and do your personal action plan. But just what I just my, my question was, once you have your purpose done, your your goals really flow from that, don't they? Because I know you told people to take a step back from their goals for the moment. But once you have your purpose, your goals flow much easier. Absolutely. And, you know, you might set some of the same goals that you would have set without the statement of purpose, but you're going to be much more driven to achieve them when you're fired up and you feel this sense of purpose. Um, we had a graduation ceremony last month, uh, the first in-person graduation ceremony that we'd had for two years because of COVID. And I met one of the participants who had actually, I think, been in this particular program several years ago and was now graduating with a master's because she'd taken on a couple of other diplomas. And when you take three of our diplomas, it becomes a master's degree. And she said, in fact, it was her husband who I met for the first time there who said to me, you know, she still uses this, this, uh, this planning approach and this purpose approach and this goal setting approach. And it's really transformed her life and it's transformed our lives as a family in, in a very positive way. Great. I, I, I think actually there's a few more questions there from participants as well. And um, Stephen, if you want to have a look at them. Okay. Um, so uh, let me see um, some of the questions here. Um, yeah, could I give some examples of statements of purpose? Well, I suppose for starters, I, I haven't memorized any off the top of my head, but I'm a little bit reluctant to do that because it has to be something that's unique to you. I've given my own, uh, which is there's always another PB to aim for. And that's something that informs, let's say, how I work. Like if I'm preparing a new seminar or something like that, I'll aim for the very best I could possibly do. Um, but that speaks to me, but it also speaks to my, my hobbies, my, my personal life and so on. And yours really has to involve mining, reflecting, looking at other people's statements of purpose or looking at other leaders who seem to have a lot of presence. I don't believe is necessarily um, the best route forward. Uh, Michelle asks, do I know a, a leader who epitomizes executive presence? Um, I don't actually want to name them because uh, some of them are colleagues of mine who really have strong presence. And I don't want to name some of the others who don't <laughs> additionally, okay? Um, but I think it is something that when we encounter it, when you encounter 
a leader with strong presence in the workplace, you know, and you also tend to know pretty quickly whether it's authentic. And interestingly, um, research by neuroscientists has shown that um, that experience of whether somebody is encountering a leader with authentic presence or less authentic, less empathic, less emotionally intelligent presence really makes a big difference in how people are able to perform and that they can't engage as well or perform their jobs as well if they're being led by people whose presence is inauthentic. And uh, Stephen, is it hard to recognize when someone has been inauthentic? I mean, I know you spoke about um, Tara so earlier. Is, is that hard to recognize for people? You know, I know some, a question came up earlier about sometimes people charisma and confidence get hired through interviews, but they're not necessarily that competent for the role. Um, you know, there are other problems as well that we face. And one of them in, actually was highlighted in uh, the, the article about Theranos that I was referring to a little bit earlier. If anyone wants to look it up, it's the December 11th, 2021 edition of The Economist. The article was called The Shortcuts to Theranos. It was under the Bartleby column. And the article was overall actually about cognitive shortcuts in decision-making. And so, for example, in recruitment, in hiring practices, one of the cognitive shortcuts is we may pay only attention to the things we want to hear and not search for disconfirming evidence or you know, not look for the underlying facts, um, be over-optimistic or have mood-based biases and so on. Um, in another module in the Diploma of Advanced Management Performance, we spend a whole day looking at decision-making processes to understand those cognitive and behavioral problems and challenges and shortcuts, and to look at ways in which we can circumvent those and make smarter decisions. Um, Bernard has asked a question, how can you stop being overloaded with uh, worker responsibilities uh, to improve one's sense of purpose? Um, I suppose the starting point is to make that a little bit of time for yourself to reflect on what your purpose is. Some people, not most, but some people who take this program and who go through this diploma actually decide that um, their, their whole job or their whole career is the wrong one for them because it's fulfilling someone else's purpose. Fortunately, most don't feel that strongly about where they're at. But what many people find is that they refine their focus. They start being clearer about what their work is, what their responsibilities or what their priorities are. And that means you're not spending your time running around doing everything driven by purposelessness or by other people's purpose. You're more focused and you're able to do, um, you're able to do, things, uh, to do things better, to perform better. Great. I see there there's a number of people asking for podcast and book recommendations and um, the links that you're talking about earlier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be sending out an email um, maybe later today uh, after the webinar for anyone who attended. So we can put some of the book recommendations and links in the email just to make it easier for everyone. Great. OK. Um, now, I'm going to pass you back to Maria because um, Maria wants to tell you a little bit more in general about the Diploma in Advanced Management Performance. Um, yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm not sure if you can hand over the control of the... Great. Um, the thanks, everyone, now for joining us this morning. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the development advanced management performance which we've been referring to today and um, for those of you who are interested um, as we said um, Stephen is obviously program director of the, of the program but he also teaches on a number of the modules and um, the one that we spoke about today purpose and executive presence and also one on decision making um, the other topics that we cover, and actually I should have included a slide on it, but I'll send you out details, is you'll look at marketing, you'll look at operations, and um, you'll do uh, the decision making and the pr pr purpose and executive presence. Um, it's a level nine qualification, so professional diploma, so um, you're awarded that by UCD. 
Um, and it's really designed to fit in with your busy work schedules and life schedules. So it's six two day modules over nine months. So you're in normally on a Friday and Saturday for two days for each module. There's six weeks in between e each module. And what happens is you'll be sent a certain amount of pre-reading before the module. So you come to the module prepared and then you do your module and you will be given a written assignment afterwards um, to show your learnings on the module. Um, it's starting um, this year on the 23rd of March and uh, we have a class size of 30 in each of our programs. We keep our class sizes small because the classes are very experiential in approach. There's a lot of um, class discussion and um, also breaking into groups um, to discuss particular case studies that we've been working on within the classroom. And indeed, actually, our mix in the classroom is one of um, one of the qualities about Smurfit Executive Development. Uh, you'll be joined by um, peers from across different industries who are all experienced in their field. Everyone has to have at least five years management experience. And actually, in fact, um, many have much more than that. Um, and the thing about the Diploma in Advanced Management Performance, the people who are attracted to it really are people who have um, become functional experts and have risen up in their sort of particular field of expertise, but are now in management roles and want to know um, more about the business and um, the entirety of the business and how it works and how their particular function affects other areas of the business and vice versa. So that's um, the benefit of it. In terms of the pricing, you'll see there it's 7,945 for the diploma. And um, there also is a UCD business alumni um, discounted rate of 7,547. Um, the diploma itself is um, part of our MSc in business leadership and management practice. And, um, sorry, I'll go back one. Um, and basically once you do three diplomas, um, you will be awarded a master's diploma. And the, the real benefit of this is you really get to pick for your career what works for you in terms of the diplomas that you want to pick from. So, um, for example, you might start off with the advanced management performance and then decide that, you know, you're really interested in finding out more about business finance and you go on and do the diploma in business finance. I'll give you um, a, a full list of all the different diplomas to choose from. But what we really recommend is start off with picking your first one. Don't be too worried about the next two because um, your ideas might change a lot along the way. So, um, sorry, just go back to the previous slide. Stephen, I'm not sure if I have control or you have control. Are you? I think uh, I think you should still be in control there. Yeah, um, sorry. Sure. No. Yeah. You want me to move on? It, move it on. Um, sorry, I was just trying to go back there, but I, I, I can send you. Anyway, I had a, a previous slide just on the objectives of um, the participant. I, so there we go. Um, so you'll see um, I've just taken a selection of, um, of the objectives that the participants that come on the program because some of them might resonate with you. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but uh, as you see, so it's, it's that the idea of becoming a better leader, you know, building up a business network, you know, once you do one of our diplomas and you graduate, you become part of UCD business alumni and um, with thousands of alumni across the world, you'll be invited to events and um, webinars and um, also the idea of increasing your own self-awareness, you know, getting back into the classroom, gaining a new perspective. Many of us have been, you know, working in the same organizations or the same roles for a long time. So it's just great to, you know, be able to step out of the classroom. Um, and things, I suppose, that touch on the mo modules that are taught on the advanced management, you know, um, a little look at strategy, the idea of um, being better decision maker, as we said, like there's a, there's a, a module that Stephen um, speaks to on becoming a, dis a better decision maker, you know, widen your career opportunities, you know, whether it's within your, your own organization or beyond. And it's really, you know, that idea of just getting back in the classroom, meeting peers from different organizations and um, building your self-confidence up again. You know, a lot of us um, who a lot of the people who do these programs ha haven't been to, to university um, in, in a long time. So it's, you know, about getting in. And then, of course, obviously, the idea of getting accredited qualification at the end um, that is um, world re renowned where you can take, you know, globally across the world and will be recognized as a level nine qualification from, uh, from UCD. Um, I seem to be having uh, trouble with my screen there, but I had um, 
uh, I might give you back just the remote control, Stephen, because it's not working as well from mine. But um, the list of the diplomas there that you can do, I think it's... Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, I'll just down a few. Yeah. Is it working at your end, Stephen? Uh, it is, but I, I'm not seeing that list in there at all, Maria. Sorry about that. Okay, that's okay. Um, I think it's that just there. There it is. Sorry, I beg your Perfect. pardon. Yeah, that's all right. right. Um, sorry about that. My screen doesn't seem to be working as well. So, I mean, you see the full list of diplomas. So there's a great, um, great categories to choose from. You know, everything from the advanced management, which we spoke about this morning, to strategy, organizational change, high performance sales, coaching, finance. Um, leadership and corporate governance. So as you can see, you can really tailor your masters um, to suit your own uh, career. Um, also just to say, hopefully you, a few of you are at um, our modules earlier, our webinars earlier in the week, and we do have the recordings on our website if you want to look back at them. But we have two more coming up as well. We have um, Professor Pat Gibbons tomorrow um, doing the social life of, stra of strategy at the same time, 10 a.m. So please do sign up if you're interested in finding up, out more about strategy. Um, and then finally, on Friday, we have um, Helen Brophy who's going to do emotional intelligence and leadership, which Stephen spoke a little bit about today. And um, so it'd be a nice follow on from this webinar. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm going to send out an email uh, later today with a recording of the webinar. So um, feel free. Obviously, you can watch it back or you can share with friends and colleagues if you think they might be interested. Um, but I'll also include um, some details of links that um, Stephen uh, touched on today and maybe some book and recommend, um, podcast rep recommendations if you have any, Stephen. So um, I'm conscious of time. We're almost um, getting up to 11 a.m. So I'm sure you all have busy days ahead of you. Um, I just really I want to thank Stephen for joining us today and giving his time for um, a great webinar and obviously to all of you for joining us. Um, have, a, have a lovely day and thanks again, Stephen. Thanks, everyone.